Let's get to the final question. What do you think of the killing? Um, the screen, unfortunately, says or George George Floyd, but it meant uh, should be of George Floyd and the protests and riots that followed. So I, I got this from a bunch of different, bunch of different people who were interested in my take on this. And when people are interested in my take on this, I, I tend to think that the, the value I can provide is more of giving a framework for thinking about something versus being a subject matter expert. Because I'm not a subject matter expert in police brutality, I'm not a subject matter expert in race relations and uh, a number of other things related to this. Although I, in my former life, I did study these things, I think more than, than most people. But I do have a certain expertise in how to think through things from a human flourishing perspective. So I just wanted to, uh, to share that. And I, I did this recently on my other podcast. So the main thing I'm gonna do in answering this question is actually play you a very extended uh, part of my last podcast which was called How to Think Constructively About Public Injustices, so not just the, the killing of George Floyd, which is definitely a public injustice, and as you'll hear me talk about, it's very disturbing in a number of ways, um, but applies to other kinds of public injustices that we see, particularly those involving police conduct. So there are four questions that I'm gonna talk about that you'll hear in a second. So what actually happened? What, if any, mistakes in policy caused this to happen? what changes in policy are being proposed, and what are the likely positive and negative consequences of the proposed policies. So to get all the details on that, just hang on and I'll play you that uh, extended, very extended excerpt. It'll be at least about, probably about 30 minutes from that episode. And then afterward, I'm just gonna close the show, this show of Power Hour by sharing with you a really interesting email I got from a police officer who follows my work and he, I found it really illuminating. So I'll share that with you, but uh, for now, enjoy this excerpt from the Human Flourishing Project. We had a very you know, disturbing public revelation of the death of George Floyd um, by well, I'll talk about that the, the details of that in a minute, but the you know the George Floyd death, and then following that, lots of outrage and in particular protests that quickly became uh, riots, and it's just a, a huge time of unrest right now. Uh, many people feeling there's all kinds of injustice in the world, and so. You know, I, I can only help so much on this kind of thing, but I thought what I would do today is talk about the topic, how to think constructively about public injustices, because with the case of George Floyd, I think we're in a situation where there's something really disturbing that could be used uh, to affect positive change, but also uh, in many ways is already being used in a negative way. So I just wanted to share my thoughts, and I'm going to yeah, title this episode, How to Think Constructively About Public Injustices. And it's mainly about what kinds of questions should we ask when we hear of a, and I'm, I'm describing it as public injustice because this is something that in some way we're all witnessing, we're all being asked uh, to think about, and it's it's something that we have to decide, okay, what, you know, what should be done uh, about this? And these often occur with different kinds of police type things because police are supposed to, um, you know, are supposed to enforce justice. And so if, if we see something that appears to be injustice, then it's very understandable for people to be upset about it and want to do something about it. Sometimes this can be true with different kinds of trial verdicts, uh, but it's just the kind of common situation, not, not, super common but but the situation we see not too infrequently where there's you know there's something public it seems really wrong and it's motivating a lot of people to want to change things and so the question today is how to think uh, constructively about that and what I want to do is basically just share four questions that I think are helpful for thinking about these things and I'll, I'll share a little bit about how I think they apply to the situation but the main thing is just to share the questions and encourage you to uh, to ask those and to ask uh, other people those, and hopefully that can lead to some constructive outcome. So I'll give you the questions overall, and then I'll talk a little bit about the current situation. So the, the four questions are, what actually happened? What, if any, mistakes in policy 
cause this to happen? That might be the most important one. What, if any, mistakes in policy cause this to happen? What changes in policy are being proposed? And then what are the likely positive and negative consequences of the proposed policies? So again, question one, what actually happened? Question two, what, if any, mistakes in policy cause this to happen? Question three, what changes in policy are being proposed? Question four, what are the likely positive and negative consequences of the proposed uh, policies? So let's start off with what actually happened. And in a sense, this is one I have the least uh, to say about, but it's really important when we're talking about a public injustice or supposed injustice to know as much as possible what actually happened. Because it, it, you know, it can be, I think there have been situations in the past where there's a claim of an injustice and there definitely wasn't one when you investigate, but there was the appearance of one. Now, in this case, I think there definitely has been one, but there's a question of what you know, what happened? Like what, and that, that to, we had to have to really understand what happened to understand what is the injustice um, involved. So just if you, if you look at the case of George Floyd, like it's, it's really hard to get a, a thorough explanation even of what people think really happened. And what, you know, one way to get at that is what are the different accounts in terms of, is there anyone defending uh, the procedures, were the procedures violated? Are they the wrong procedures? I mean, what we can see by the video that's, I think, is definitely important to watch, and I've, I've tried to watch a bunch of them in a bunch of different angles. I mean, you can see, I mean, the thing that's super disturbing is just, you see this guy, and, and particularly once you know, okay, the the crime involved or this, the suspected crime is like a forged $20 bill. So this is not somebody who's trying to murder somebody who's like an active threat to anybody. So in this case, you're thinking, okay, this is a situation where you would expect a kind of minimal um, amount of force. And then, you know, you see him and he seems subdued. And yet, you know, the main police officer, um, the Derek Chauvin, you know, has his knee on his neck and there's other people restraining him and cops holding them away. And you can just see that it's, it's just, you just think, what, what is happening here? Why is this, how is this possibly necessary? Why is this cop so indifferent to this guy? I mean, this guy's saying, I can't, you know, I can't breathe. What, what, and in another aspect of it is just people are, are talking to the cops and asking them, hey, what's going on? And the cops aren't saying anything. So it's like they don't feel any need to explain themselves, to justify themselves, even though to any bystander, I mean, this looks, I mean, this looks literally murderous to be doing uh, to this guy. And so I don't have too much to say about what actually happened, except there are very clearly some very bad things that happened. Uh, but even then I would want to know, like, okay, what is there... Like, what is the explanation? Like, is it, because it doesn't, the, I think the mainstream explanation seems to be something like, it's just like cops sort of overflowing with racism, callously killed this guy. And this is not what it looks like. It doesn't even, I mean, it, there can definitely be a racial component, but the thing that really seems to stand out from what I know of the evidence is just like the complete excessiveness of the force, the lack of communication, the complete indifference toward the suffering of the individual and the possible death of the individual. I mean, I've heard some things about, like, okay, is it that in some way they were restraining him for his own good because he was intoxicated and like there was some risk of him going in? I mean, if that was the case, then there's still the element of, well, they need to, like, they would need to explain that and there needs to be some transparency about it because otherwise everyone would have every reason to think the police are breaking the law and we need to, we might even need to risk our lives to stop what um, what they're doing. So what um, what actually happened? And it's not enough that it's, I mean, one thing is it has to be actually bad, but I want to know, okay, what ways is this bad? What actually happened? And sometimes it's useful to ask, okay, what are, are there different sides to the story? What, what's, what's a realist, another way to think of this is, what's a realistic way this could have happened, taking into account human motivations? And I think when we talk about Often when we talk about motivations of bad things, it's easy to just dehumanize people and act like, oh, they're totally different and they're just bad and they're just racist and they're just, but there's something going on. So what is going on inside these people's heads? What's going on with the policy? I want to know these things to know what happened. And then that's the only way I'm going to know, okay, what, you know, what are the policy changes that need to happen? So what actually happened? And if anyone has any really good accounts of what actually happened, 
that are you know, unusually objective, please send them to me, alex at alexepstein.com. But for our purposes, let's say, I mean, I'll say, yeah, so there are some really, really bad things that happened here, at least in, in my current understanding. And so I think there's definitely, it's not a case where, oh, everything went well. I mean, far, the farthest thing from it, I think. And so then there's this question, and this might be the most important question of what if any mistakes in policy caused this to happen? And, and why am I emphasizing policy? Well, what can happen is that you have the right policy. So in this case, the right set of laws and rules for police and they were it's just a failed application so you have a cop let's say that or in this case several cops though who are going against the rules and in the end but then in that case you would have rules about what happens when you go against the rules and then they would be presumably prosecuted and punished and then you could say okay it was really bad that they violated the rules, but there's not a fundamental policy change. Or maybe maybe it would be there's a there's a policy change somewhere else. So it's, is it a policy change in terms of the you know you've heard unions unions pressuring even ba- pressuring uh, you know, government such that it's really hard to fire a member of the police force or you know insufficient training in certain ways. But it's really important to just have an idea of okay, do we think the policy was right and just somebody failed to act uh, in accordance with the policy and that can happen and then just the policy, need, then, then the punitive policy needs to be enforced or is there something wrong with the policy? And in this case, I am, I, I very strongly suspect that it's there's a bunch of things wrong in the policy. And so you know, I've heard, and but again, I'm, I'm focusing on questions in this episode because I don't, have at all the expertise on this issue, but I I do have, I think, some expertise in how to think constructively about these things. And so I'm in part asking these, raising these questions because I think they help us get toward the answer and you can also find better sources. And again, I'm really interested in any kind of better sources. But if you look at, I mean, so one one thing that people have raised that resonates a lot with me is the level of militarization of the police. And this is something that's often glorified on TV, but essentially having just a lot of overlap between the way our military officers are armed and deployed and the way police officers are armed and deployed, including just having these incredible amounts of protection and going in these teams and like busting down doors and having these amazing uh, kinds of weapons and in some way having an itchy trigger finger, you know, that kind of thing can happen. And there's just when you're talking about the police, these are people whose their whole job is to protect our freedom. So they their conduct needs to be very circumscribed so that they're actually acting in a way that's consistent with protecting freedom. It's not just, oh, anything that goes wrong at all, then they have they can use unlimited force. And so something like, why is it that that there's this much force being applied when it's this kind of when you're talking about a potential you know, forged $20 bill. (laughs) Maybe there's an explanation for that, but I haven't heard it. And so that's a kind of variable. I think that's a real thing. There's also people talk about this issue of lack of qualified immunity. So police are in certain ways immune to prosecution. And that seems like a, you know, a very plausible thing that's going wrong in terms of policy just from what I know, the things I'm looking for, okay, what, what, what is causing the, the problematic elements here? So what is causing the excess, seemingly excessive use of force? What's also the, there's a lot of questions about what's causing the lack of transparency. I, I find lack of transparency by government to be in general, very disturbing. And I've, I've talked a lot about with lockdowns, how part of it is just, there's no real explanation of it. And there's a huge amount of arbitrary power. I just think that's completely inappropriate for government in general. And whether you're making these these kinds of you're making these kinds of dictates in a in a seemingly civilized way, but you're really ultimately forcing people to act in accordance with them, and it's ultimately backed up by the police. Whether it's that where the police aren't really at the fore, or whether it's something where their their ability to use force is completely at the fore because they can actually, you know, their misconduct can actually kill somebody who doesn't deserve uh, to be killed. So the question, again, is what if any mistakes in policy 
caused this to happen. And, and, and I don't think without a clear idea of that, it's almost impossible to do anything constructive. And, and I think the most one can do if one has no idea about this is say, hey, there's something really wrong here. Let's have a discussion about what, if any, mistakes in policy caused this to happen. The third question is, what changes in policy are being proposed? This is important because we want to know the policy options. It's also very important if we're considering joining any particular cause or method of dealing with it. And I think this came up in the past week because there was a you know, very wide phenomenon of people putting uh, like a black screen on their social media profiles and sometimes using the hashtag I think it was Blackout Tuesday or Black Lives Matter. And I always want to know what changes in policy are, are being proposed because, as I'll talk about in, with the next question, there's just such a potential for the wrong policies to be proposed to deal with a wrong, but to have the you know another wrong, so two wrongs don't make a right type thing. So whenever somebody is, is they're protesting or saying something, I want to know, what policies are being proposed? And just to familiarize myself with any organization, what are they actually saying should be done? And then that'll just move right into the fourth question, which is what are the likely positive and negative consequences of the proposed policies? So if, if you look at this issue, there's such a wide range of things being proposed. And I think on, on the reasonable side, well, I would I would have three categories, like reasonable, unreasonable, and nothing. Uh, but in a sense, the nothing is the worst. But so the reasonable would be, let's say there's the congressman, Justin Amash, and he's focused on the ending qualified immunity. And that's something where I would want to see, okay, what are the positives and negatives of that? But there, there's a plausibility that, that has a logic to it, seems reasonable. But again, I would that's the kind of thing we still need to really think through it and think about, okay, are there issues? What was and one question is what was the reason for having this qualified immunity in the first place? What led to that? Have those reasons changed? I would just want to know um, those kinds of things. But I, I would say that I have not seen most of what I've seen has been in the poly, the category of things that are either unreasonable or very, very far fetched to me and certainly not uh, justified by, I mean, by uh, evidence. So, you know, I saw one kind of meme going up about, okay, here are eight different things. And they say something like, one of them was no strangleholds. Now, I, I probably have a lot more familiarity with strangleholds than most people because I do it recreationally in terms of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, but there are a whole bunch of reasons why you would want strangleholds and why those can actually be much more humane than shooting people. And I know that the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community has done a lot of work with law enforcement, helping them learn how to control people in a humane way. So I think that, that a stranglehold can be part of the most humane strategy. And if you're taught really well, it's essentially zero risk to people. But and I got just really upset when I noticed people just saying, oh, yeah, no strangleholds. Like there was a stranglehold here. I, wasn't, I don't even think it was technically a stranglehold, but they had a knee on somebody's neck with his face in the ground. So that that seems like, I mean, when there's no resistance, it's just I cannot see any justification for that whatsoever. But to go to say no strangleholds, this is, the, this is where we can totally do more harm than good by just saying, okay, there's something bad going on, but we're not going to think it through. And we're just going to say, here's something we should do. And then let's get a law passed. And then, but it can just have huge amounts of destruction. You know, another one that I just think is totally irrational is the defund the police. I mean, this is one where I, I know for a fact that just people, particularly in poorer areas and often minority areas are just terrified of this idea of defunding the police because in many, many cases, what they feel like is the police have problems, but the real thing is the police are protecting them from criminals and what they don't want to do, often criminals of the same race, and what they don't want is the police to leave their area because they will be very much at the mercy of uh, criminals. And this connects to another kind of a policy of sorts. I mean, you can think of it as the protesting and in particular the rioting as a kind of policy, as in they're saying, well, this is this is justified 
there is this injustice. And so this is, this is part of our policy is we are going to get attention by, uh, destroying property. And even with the protesting, I see this narrative that, oh, well, protesting is the most American thing. What could be more American than protesting? I don't know. I think you should be able to protest on your own property and protest in a way that respects people's rights. And certainly in the era of social media, we have a lot to, a lot of ways we can do that and get attention. But to say that when there's an injustice that you get to indefinitely disrupt everybody's lives and just swarm the streets indefinitely and prevent, you know, prevent people from going to work. I mean, you're going to kill people who can't get to the hospital, for example. I, I think there's this whole, I mean, that's, this is a whole other subject, but we, I think we should think about when, even when we hear somebody is protesting as a response, not just say reflexively, oh, that's good, but say, is that really a fair and proper thing to do? What are the positive and negative consequences of that? Because these protests have hugely negative consequences even leaving aside the rioting. And if you look at the rioting, I mean, it's just so tragic to see people's just lie. I mean, literally many people getting killed in these things. And then they're just, they're just people's life's work getting destroyed. People being terrified. People saying like, I'm not going to rebuild this business. Again, it's just, it's so bad. And so much of it is coming from not this idea that we don't have to think through our response. We just have to be upset. And if there's something that's really bad, then then anything is permitted. A final area of the proposed policies is the kind of just general, let's shut down capitalism type stuff. And this is where just you really need to think about is there any basis for this whatsoever? Because if you think about, okay, what are the actual police states? Those are not capitalist countries. Capitalist countries are countries that respect property rights. The police states, which often call themselves socialist, those are those are the ones where police have absolute power and abuse it left and right. And so just just to say, okay, this there's a really something really bad that happened. And so we're going to attack the whole capitalist system, including people's property rights. That is just a completely unjustified reaction to all of this. So unfortunately, I don't think that people are thinking through what changes are being proposed and what are the likely positive and negative consequences of the proposed policies, because most of the proposed policies or even just the actions taken so far are just hugely, hugely negative. So those are the and I wish I had a more positive note to end these questions on, but I think that that is, I'm, I'm raising this in part just because it's not a positive thing right now, but I think these constructive things, there can be positive consequences. There is a world in which we took what happened in the George Floyd case and we used it to really improve how police forces function insofar as there are policy problems. Like There is a world where that could happen, and I'm not seeing it happen right now, so I would just try to make a contribution toward that. Now, as, as we wrap up, I want to, in the context of these four questions, just share what I think are some mistakes that I think that are causing unconstructive responses. I'll just go through these quickly. So one is yes, but thinking with regard to injustices. So you see, I've seen a bunch of versions of this, but some people who've been oppo really opposed to the riots, which I'm very sympathetic with, have said, yes, you know, yes, it was a horrible thing that happened to George Floyd, but the riots are worse. And then people say, well, no, yes, riots are bad. You know, destroying a building is bad, but killing an innocent person is worse. Um, and then there's even this view of like, oh, well, yes, he did this, but he was a bad guy in some definite ways. I think that's uh, definitely true, and I think it's totally wrong for the media to act. I mean, there's this NPR narrative like, oh, this is a gentle giant and not talking about like a serious criminal history, including some really bad stuff he did during his life. But he definitely did not deserve to die this way. That did not, that was not being punished for that. And so, but that is an example of like, you want not yes, but thinking, but yes, and thinking. When, when we're dealing with multiple injustices, it's not useful to say, okay, well, this one is bad or this, this one is, uh, is bad, but my injustice is really, really bad. 
And you just think, why are you doing that? So I I just say when we're dealing with these multiple injustices, and particularly if there's an unjust response to an injustice, it's, it's really valuable to just say, okay, these are all injustices. And let's think about what's the interrelationship among the different injustices and the different issues involved versus like saying one doesn't count or another doesn't uh, count. And I just seeing a lot of that. And I don't think that's at all constructive. Uh, Another one is taking easy actions to gain status and avoid shaming. So I would put a lot of the, not all of it, because I can't speak to all of it, but a lot of the use of the black box and the use of the expression Black Lives Matter, I am very suspicious of. And I, I'm, but I should say, I'm very suspicious of anything in life that is done that gives easy status. Anything where there's easy, because st- what does it mean that it gives you easy status? You don't really have to do anything and you get viewed as doing the right thing. And often it's you gain status easily and you avoid shaming easily. But if it's really, if there's really just that clear cut an issue, then probably almost every reasonable person is going to agree on it. But usually what happens is the issue involved that you're you're endorsing is not clear-cut. So if it's the death of George Floyd was a grave injustice or the way that occurred, then I think almost everybody agrees with that. But then it's people are then saying they're having to repeat like the hashtag Black Lives Matter or Blackout Tuesday – but that's not something obvious. If you look at what Black Lives Matter stands for, what what positions they've taken, you definitely couldn't say those are all obvious positions. And then a lot of the positions that are being connected with that, you know, very closely, whether they're explicitly part of the official Black Lives Matter movement or not, but things like defund police or certain characterizations of generalizations about police or generalizations about most Americans being racist in different kinds of ways, those are certainly not obvious even if you think they're they're true. And so these these kinds of easy actions, what they end up doing is they don't clarify the issue. They just actually lead to a lack of discussion about the issue. And one can very easily inadvertently support a bad policy. So you th- if you just think about maybe by putting up a black box, maybe I'm supporting a policy, maybe I'm going to contribute to the defunding of police that's going to hurt a lot of innocent you know, let's just say in this case, black individuals in a poor neighborhood, if, if you're focused in particular on innocent black lives mattering. And that can so easily happen just by taking these easy actions to gain status and avoid shaming. And related to this is the idea of like a big mistake, I think, is just activism without a clear goal. We should just be really clear on what, what are we trying to achieve and then thinking it through with the four questions I mentioned. And I saw a tweet recently that captured a lot of these things. Uh, It was by uh, Scott Adams, who's an uh, interesting guy. He's the creator of the Dilbert cartoon, but he's also a cultural commentator. And he says, I can't respect a protest that has these qualities. One, no specific suggestions on what to change. Two, data is not allowed into the debate. Three, dissenting opinions, no matter how respectful and well-meaning, are not allowed. Four, low regard for public safety. And I agree with that. Uh, totally. And I don't think Adam's point at all is that this is okay, or we should be indifferent, or we shouldn't do anything. It's that we need to think really carefully when we see these public injustices. So again, what actually happened? What if any mistakes in policy caused this to happen? What changes in policy are being proposed? And what are the likely positive and negative consequences of the proposed policies? Okay, I am back live, so to speak, on Power Hour. So I just want to read you this response I got from a, I'm going to call a rational police officer. I don't know him and uh, personally, but the way he's writing makes a ton of sense to me. And the overriding thought I had as I read this initially was, why aren't we hearing more voices like this? Why are we hearing just voices who have no context, no experience, have just clear agendas, why don't we hear from some more rational people in in law enforcement about what went wrong here? And uh, but really, tr- really trying to understand it for the purposes of making constructive changes versus just trying to use it as something to advance some pre-existing agenda, which I think is a lot of what's going on, or in some cases, just the agenda of looting. 
uh, things. So I'm just going to read this to you and I'll comment occasionally. So here's the beginning. I'm quoting him. So there are a lot of moving pieces regarding what happened. When I first saw the video, my assumption was that the officer was restraining someone who was undergoing exited delirium and the person ended up having a heart attack. So I just want to pause here as Alex. So it's really interesting that this the police officer has experience because there, there's a lot of questions about, look, as I said on the Human Flourishing Project, what exactly is happening? And so was it like, how could they possibly do that? Was there, is there any rationale for it even it was i think clearly the wrong way of approaching it but like and so there was this idea that oh maybe there was something where like the and it might be i don't know exited delirium or excited delirium i'm not sure if it was a, a misspelling but like these are these are situations that most of us are not familiar with i i, I have familiarity with strangleholds but i don't have familiarity with all the different situations police officers are in so it's really interesting just to hear oh here's what somebody with experience says about this horrifying thing that we're seeing so i'll continue that being said the officer seemed to be excessive in his force since mr floyd was both handcuffed and non-combative furthermore stating that he was having trouble breathing not one cop i know looked at that video and thought yeah, that looks right. Many of us rack our brains to try it and figure out the possible motivations of the officer while only having limited info. And as Alex, I'll pause again. Like this is a this is the kind of thing I appreciate where somebody is even when it's disturbing and it's disturbing even to the police officer. They're trying to figure out what is actually happening, not to exonerate the police officer, but actually just to understand to know what is going wrong and and what actually should be condemned. Uh, so to continue, the best I can come up with is that the officer has had experience with uh, subjects suffering exited delirium and was zealously determined to keep Mr. Floyd from hurting himself or others. But the officer has 19 years on, and while that may have been his intention, the optics are bad, the technique is completely unnecessary, and it may have contributed to the cause of death. I think that is what most cops were thinking when they see the video. I think the autopsy, which now it seems there are competing findings, is the best scientific way of determining cause of death. Medical examiners are really good at what they do, and there is solid science that indicates causes of death. So in the end, the autopsy will assist substantially with the question, what happened? It will also play a huge role in the trial. If the autopsy finds evidence of suffocation, asphyxiation, or carotid artery obstruction as a cause or contributing factor of death, then it'll be pretty clear cut. If not, then... Who knows? And just interjecting as Alex. So this, again, just seems a very thoughtful, not the kind of thing you see in the media, but makes sense. He continues, in terms of policies that come into play, I can really only speak from my own agency's set of rules. In terms of use of force, we are to use the least amount of force necessary to accomplish the task at hand, which is make an arrest and defend self or others, as opposed to the most amount of force allowable by law. I think a lot of other major agencies now have similar policies. The other factors that come into play when using force from a policy standpoint is what we call governmental interest. Are we going to get into a 100 mile per hour car chase with someone who stole a bag of chips from 7-Eleven? No. The risk in that, highly, in that highly outweighs the benefits of capture. On the other hand, the person who just murdered a bunch of people, ran over a cop when apprehended and is now on the loose, the benefit of that capture highly outweighs the risk of the pursuit. So interjecting again as Alex. So this makes a lot of sense. I don't know if I were an expert in this field, would I formulate the policy exactly this way? But it's good to know what the actual policies are. One question I had with the Minneapolis situation is what were the actual policies and what was a violation of policy versus what was, uh, there's something wrong with the policy itself. That's really crucial. How does that apply to the situation in Minneapolis? I don't know the full story, but if it was just the attempted use of forged money, I likely would have just gotten the subject's name and info, seized the fake money, wrote a quick report about it, and put the forged bill into our property evidence room. End of story. No cuffs, no force, not a ton of governmental interest involved. And he says, anyway, I don't want to ramble on, but those are some of the points that can help us think about the whole situation. I don't know if that was helpful, but let me know if you want me to expand on anything or if you have a specific area of inquiry that I can address, please let me know. And so I'll just say to the officer, I'm keeping him and where he's from totally anonymous, uh, but I found that incredibly helpful, maybe most of all, just as such a refreshing perspective from someone who's in law enforcement, who is really conscientious, who's trying to understand what happened without 
the partisanship of saying, oh, I need to defend, you know, the boys in blue, nor just needing to say something completely condemnatory uh, to join the popular movement. He's thinking about it very carefully. That's what I think we need more of. And I think it's, it's just such a tragedy that there's so little thought going on. And, and I do think that it's, I think the videos like the George Floyd video are really important. I think one of the, this is a broader point, but I think one of the benefits of the age we live in is that we are able to see, I mean, there's much more visibility into what human beings are doing, both good and bad. And you see this in all sorts of places. I mean, even something like product quality, you have Amazon reviews now. The level of product quality, I'm sure, has dramatically increased because there's so much more awareness from users of the product, how good the product actually is. That's kind of visibility we have into human behavior. And in general, the more visibility we have into human behavior, the more ethical conduct benefits because in general, we want to deal with ethical people. So the more information there is about people's conduct, the more inf the more it's an incentive toward ethical behavior. And it can also be, it can also alert us to big problems, including we can see something that happens with police. And particularly if it's something that happens frequently, these kinds of videos can bring that to our attention. But they're only valuable if we if we not only consume them, but we really think about them and we try to think about them in context because that way we can have an, a broader awareness of what's happening in reality, but we can have a responsible awareness where we're, we're trying to put everything together and draw the right conclusions and, and come up with the right policies. But if we just take this kind of visibility and we just react to it emotionally, and we we bring in all our pre-existing biases and pre-existing agendas, then it can lead to total disaster. And so far, even with the, the George Floyd saga, I don't know how many people have been killed in terms of innocent people and, and police officers, and I think in many cases, innocent police officers, but there's been so much death, absolute death already, leaving aside just the massive destruction from rioting and then the you know, the blocking of vital different kinds of services by the protests. This is just such an example of how we're totally thro in so throwing away the opportunity that we have with this information by not truly contextualizing it. And that's part of the reason I felt compelled to talk about it was to just give, give uh, you or anyone who's interested in my ideas more of a framework for thinking about this kind of thing so that there can be a more positive discussion. Again, I don't have much expertise in these issues, but I can give a framework that I think would be beneficial for other people to use in explaining these issues. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.